All right. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, it's really nice to see some familiar faces in the crowd. Wonderful um, to have uh, Dr. Sigrid Schmalter uh, joining us today. Um, to all the attendees, you can feel free, uh, it's a small group, you can feel free to um, uh, type questions into the chat. You can feel free to wait until the conclusion of uh, the opening remarks, and then you can uh, raise your hand or, or go ahead and jump in, especially because it's a small group today, um, and, uh, and, and share your thoughts or your questions or comments after uh, Professor Schmalter's uh, initial remarks. I'll share a sampling of her, uh, her publications and her uh, relevant websites in just a minute as well. Um, today's event is made possible by the History Department, the History Club, the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the Senior Faculty Research Fellowship, the Intellectual Life Fund, and academic programs all here at uh, California State University, San Bernardino. Uh, and I want to thank especially uh, Pamela Crossan uh, in our History Department office for all that she uh, does uh, to make, make these events possible. Uh, and first and last, uh, great thanks to Professor Sigrid Schmalzer uh, for joining us today. Her talk today is uh, titled Connecting the Dots in PRC agriculture and politics, systems thinking in the Mao and reform eras. Uh, Professor Schmalzer received her PhD uh, from the University of California, San Diego. Uh, and um, she, her, her work focuses primarily on social, cultural, and political aspects of the history of science in modern China, and also includes the history of science activism transnationally. She's published numerous academic books and articles along with a children's picture book based on her research. And I'll share in the chat and the description later a sampling of some of these works. You can click through. Um, a, a quick, uh, we'll be here for a while if I list all of them, but I just wanna list a few uh, of the, the most relevant. Uh, Red Revolution, Green Re Revolution, um, Scientific Farming in Socialist China, published uh, by University of Chicago Press in 2016, um, and winner of the Joseph Levinson Book Prize. Uh, which for those who are uninitiated is the, basically the league MVP for folks in our, our line of work. Um, also, uh, Professor Schmaltz is author of The People's Peking Man, Popular Science and Human Identity in 20th Century China, also from Chicago, uh, 2008. And that was the winner of the 2009 Alan Sharlin Award from the Social Science History Association. With James Cook, Josh Goldstein, who's joining us today, Matt Johnson, uh, she's the editor and contributor to Visualizing Modern China, Image, History, and Memory, 1750 to the Present. Um, and I'll also share a link uh, to the accompanying website to that uh, volume. She's also the lead organizer for a 2014 conference, Science for the People, the 1970s and Today, which brought together students, scholars, and science and technology studies and former members of the 1970s to 80s group, Science for the People. Uh, and I'll include relevant links uh, to this project as well. Uh, as well as a, a, a book of documents that, that, uh, that resulted from that. Um, I uh, oh, fi finally want to note a, a, a couple of things. The, the Critical China Scholars Group, which I'll also share a, um, uh, a link to uh, in the chat in the description. And I'm really eager actually to hear more about that. Uh, and finally, Moth and Wasp, a children's book, Moth and Wasp, Soil and Ocean, Remembering Chinese scientist Pu Long from Tilbury House, 2018, um, a winner of uh, many, many awards, uh, that children's book as well. Uh, really wonderful to have uh, Professor Sigrid Schmaltzer joining us today. Please join me in giving her a virtual welcome. Thank you, Sigrid. Thank you so much. That introduction was far too kind. Um, and I just, I'm really honored to be here and it's really wonderful to see so many familiar faces. Um, if, if there's an upside to everything we've been through with this pandemic, it's actually more contact with people who are far away um, and suddenly seem, seem closer. Um, so I really want to thank Jeremy Murray for inviting me and uh, the History Department and History Club and all the other co-sponsors um, that he mentioned and Pamela Crossan from um, the department who is providing all this support. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you all uh, have to say about this project, which is um, 
new stuff that um, I'm, you know, in, in the process of, of sorting out. And the, the title Connecting the Dots is one of those um, silly puns that academics like um, that refers both to my effort to put the materials all together and also the way in which systems thinking um, seeks to, to integrate and, and connect uh, different, um, different components. So we'll get up to all of that. Um, I want to start uh, today by introducing one example of the kind of thing that's been fascinating me recently, known today as agroecological systems. These are farming practices that conspicuously bring together different types of production in mutually beneficial ways, and which have a history, you know, long known to have a longish history of use in China. Among these agroecological systems, perhaps the best known is the dike pond system of southern China. And since this is going to be a particular focus in today's talk, I'm going to just uh, introduce you all to it um, for a few minutes. So the photograph on the left is beautiful and it's intended to be so since part of the significance that's accorded to these systems these days is aesthetic. The diagram at the bottom, if there's anyone in the audience, which I don't think there is, who uh, took the um, Gaokao, the college entrance exams in the 1980s, they might be familiar with this diagram. I'm going to talk about it later in the talk, um, along with many other diagrams like it. But first, um, I'd like to direct your attention to the upper right hand diagram. Uh, this represents a more recent effort to explain this set of agricultural practices, specifically as an ecological system. And the key word here really is system, um, because we don't make diagrams like this unless we're trying to understand the systemic relationship among all of these components. So you'll see in the picture, we've got a fish pond on uh, the sides of the fish pond. We have these raised bits of land called dikes. On the dikes are planted mulberry trees. The mulberry tree leaves feed the silkworms. The silkworms produce silk, which is one major product from this system. They also produce feces and other detritus that's fed to the fish. Um, and the fish being the other major product from the, from the system. And then the key thing that I want you to notice is the way the person making this diagram has very intentionally closed the loop. They've, uh, they're emphasizing that this is a full circle by showing how the fish in turn fertilize the mulberry trees because the fish also have feces that, that create this very fertile mud at the bottom of the pond. The pond is periodically dredged and uh, that mud is used to fertilize the trees. Uh, so there's this very, there's an intentionality here in demonstrating that this is a full ecological system in which each part is benefiting from and contributing to the other parts. So today systems like these are celebrated as evidence that traditional Chinese knowledge is inherently ecological and rational, and at the same time that it represents a holistic corrective to Western scientific reductionism. It's taken as a model of human intervention in nature that's positive and sustainable. And so this is to be distinguished from forms of conservation where land is taken and put aside and uh, you know, declared wilderness and humans aren't in intervening. This agroecology is a blend of agriculture and ecology, agriculture being a human endeavor and something that is perceived by agroecologists and others who promote this form of, of agriculture to be something that can be engaged in in a um, way that is sustainable and even positive ecologically. And for that reason, these Chinese uh, systems have been inspiring to proponents of agroecology, that is ecologists who set, specialize in agriculture um, all around the world. Um, and they are also highly resonant with Xi Jinping's technocratic vision of ecological civilization, and I'll get to this uh, a bit later in the talk. And finally, they're marketed. They are explicitly, unapologetically marketed for their beauty, culture, historicity, and their potential to save humanity, not to put too fine a point on it. Um, so the political weight that these um, systems now carry have led me to really want to know more about them. I want to know where the systems come from, how their conceptualization has changed and or persisted over time, and how the emphasis on systems thinking has shaped core scientific and political values 
in the PRC. So these are going to be the main things I'm looking at today. Now, I'm only going to spend a few minutes um, talking about imperial era tax. This is definitely not uh, the focus of my project, nor is it my, um, you know, area of expertise. My project is on PRC history, Chinese history since 1949. Um, but I do need to at least look at these texts because the historical actors I'm studying refer back to them as evidence of the long history of the use of ecological systems in Chinese agriculture. And so I need to be able to know about them and know what I make of them. Um, this, uh, I share this diagram. This comes from a, um, an article from a PRC-based scholar in 2000. And you can see um, again, on the right, it's a triangle, but we can think of it as a full circle, right? Uh, mulberry is feeding silkworms. Silkworms are feeding fish. Fish are nourishing the mulberry trees through that fertile mud at the pond bottom. The author has also highlighted the use of pigs and goats and grains. And this diagram you know, is produced through the aggregation of data from uh, the texts from this period in the late Ming Dynasty in this area of Zhejiang province. And so what the author is doing is pulling out information from these texts so that they can get a picture and share that picture with us of what uh, agriculture, what, what, what agriculture looked like in the terms that we care about today. So I want to emphasize this. I think, you know, this is certainly an effective way to capture the practice of ecological farming in a certain place during a certain historical period, but it's not necessarily an effective way to capture the thinking of historical actors about those practices, right? It's translated into terms that are of interest to the, um, the, the scholars today. Um, but looking at this diagram, along with a recent article by Francesca Bray on the use of modern diagramming practices in historical research, inspired me to do my own mapping of a couple of the late imperial texts that are frequently cited in recent histories of ecological agriculture from the PRC in order to capture the um, thinking of historical actors and see how it compares with more recent systems thinking. So I'm going to look at the text first, and then I'll show you the diagram that I created. So this first passage is from a mid Ming dynasty literatus. Um, it's very frequently cited as an example of imperial era writings on agroecological systems. I actually don't see that much here in this passage that really testifies to uh, at thinking about ecological relationships uh, among the components that are described here. So certainly we could see ecological relationships here, but there's not that much evidence to my eye that that's what's motivating the person who's writing about this. We see that the pigs are uh, feeding the fish with their droppings. We also see that the fish ponds are cooling the place where the pigs live. And we could think of that as an ecological relationship. It's a kind of en energy transfer that that's the kind of thing that can sometimes be captured in an ecological diagram. Um, but other than that, um, what I see is the main driving force here, the logic of circulation looks financial to me. And so money is what I wanted to highlight in my diagram. This is what happens when your kids are home um, and uh, you have a lot of more access to colored pens. I got creative and got out my colored pens and drew this up. And you can see I've you know, tried to capture the pigs feeding the fish, the fish cooling the pigs. If we stretch our minds, we could think of the dikes containing the water as a kind of ecological relationship. But the main relationship here, it's about the money, the money that is coming, uh, the income that's flowing from these different endeavors and enriching the farm household. Note also that this is there's no effort here to describe this as a kind of self-sufficient system. The, the income implies um, that it's connected to a larger, um, a larger economy. Um, and this is not really a surprise because, you know, these same texts that are now being used to uh, emphasize the history of agroecology in, um, in China have also, in fact, been used. In fact, this very text has been used uh, to talk about um, a, the history of proto-capitalism in uh, Ming Dynasty China. 
one more text um, and one more drawing. Um, this one from a late Qing dynasty gazetteer from Guangdong. This one is maybe a bit more straightforward and perhaps we can imagine a diagram more like what I showed before with the mulberry leaves feeding the silkworms, silkworm droppings feeding the fish. But here I note that there's no mention of the pond mud fertilizing the trees. So the loop is not completed. There's not an effort to make this like a full circle the way we've seen before. It's more of a one-way chain, mulberry to silk to fish. But we could arguably still say that there's some kind of systems thinking going on here. Um, it's presented as two profit-oriented activities. One is reinforced by the other and they're integrated and so operate as a whole. So I think you know there, there, there could be an argument here that there's a kind of systems thinking at play. So with that, I'm going to leap into the main materials that I'm investigating for this project, which come from the post-1949 period, beginning with the Mao era. And what I've been noticing over the years of working on agriculture and politics in Mao era China is that everywhere we look, there's a tremendous emphasis on integration, which of course is a very central aspect of systems thinking. So I'm not gonna go item by item um, through this list. What I want is just to give you a sense of how many such examples there are. And this is by no means exhaustive. So these examples come mostly from agriculture, but it's a phenomenon that extends everywhere. And I think it points very clearly to what scholars in science and technology studies call the co-production of scientific and political knowledge. So looking at the list, I wanna highlight that the forms that integration took were not just material, although they were material, it's important that they were material, but they were also social, political, administrative, or even epistemological. So for example, in the three-in-one scientific experiment groups, which I spent a lot of time talking about in the Red Revolution, Green Revolution book, the idea was to bring together peasants and technicians and political cadres who each had a different kind of knowledge so as to create an epistemologically diverse and robust revolutionary form of scientific practice. And then farther down the list, the concept of integrated use, Zongho Li Yong, in which the waste products of one industry were recaptured to feed other industries. This was very obviously about material integration, but also about integrating administrative spheres with very different knowledge forms. So for example, the recapturing of sewage water for agricultural and aquacultural purposes could be thought of as integrating agriculture, urban administration, public health, and fisheries. And I'll just highlight here too, knowing the audience, um, that uh, you may be familiar with Jen Altahanger's uh, current project, which is looking at um, this concept of integrated use in the timber and fiberboard industries. And then Josh Goldstein's amazing new book on recycling. Um, there's a lot in there that um, where the Zongho Leong principle is, is factoring in of the kind of management and you know, utilization of, of waste. So that's a great place to look for more on this. Um, but to go deeper into some specific examples from my project, I wanna to return to the dike pond system and the most influential of the Mao era analyses of this system, which appeared in an article in 1958 by the economic geographer Zhong Gongfu. And in this passage, he's describing the traditional system, but he's doing so using the language of socialist economic geography. And in particular, he's talking about production links. So he's translating the traditional practices of Pearl River farmers into this new language where we can really see a systems um, analysis is, is, is very strong. Because unlike in the imperial era texts we looked at, Zhong is very carefully, again, tracing a fully circular system, showing how the fish ponds fertilize the mulberry trees completing that cycle. But actually the system he was most interested in describing was a bit different. And though people continue to conceive of it as a mulberry silk fish pond system, you'll see there's another major industry involved in the key diagram for his um, article, which is this diagram, and that's sugar. So sugar had grown in importance after the silk crash in 1926, and Zhong Gongfu was interested in resolving what he called a contradiction that had emerged between the silk and the sugar industries. 
So at the bottom, we see a physical depiction of a pond between two raised pieces of land or dikes. The left di side dike uh, is planted with mulberry. The right side dike is planted with sugar. And then each of these production areas leads upward through the diagram. And you see there's three major um, outputs then, silk, fish, and sugar. You can see arrows in between um, showing how the different uh, components all benefit one another in this you know, uh, ecological-like system. Um, and also notice that as in the Ming Dynasty example, we are seeing the logic of export, right? This is not being described as some kind of idealistic self-sufficient system, but rather one that's meant to be linked into a larger economy um, and you know, with, these, with these items being exported out of the region. Now, Zhong Gongfu's article attracted some attention at the time, and a few others also wrote on this system in the early 1960s, but it really took off after 1980 when he republished his findings along with this diagram again. And the diagram then became a kind of locus classicus for the identification of the dike pond system as an agroecological exemplar. And indeed, it was used as an exemplar in um, the geography uh, college entrance exams, the Gaokao in the 1980s. So note here also, Zhong is calling the diagram a production links chart. Again, that's a key term uh, in economic geography and uh, was found prominently in geography textbooks by around 1959. I wanna look at one more example from some other economic geographers employing a production links chart to illustrate the functioning of what were called zonghati, which we could translate simply as uh, complexes. I think that's how it's usually translated, but I've, uh, I've, I've called it an integrated production complex, really just to highlight how the principle of integration is very fully developed here. So in the text accompanying the diagram, it explains that the commune includes many different kinds of production departments, all of which are very closely connected. So vegetables are at the center of production, and that's the double ring circle right in the middle. Uh, but all of the components mutually benefit one another. So for example, the vegetable byproducts feed the pigs who are represented in the very topmost small circle and the pigs produce fertilizer for the vegetables. And as the article sums it up, the other departments in the commune all revolve around the fruits and vegetables production formally forming a mutually connected organic whole. So in Chinese, this is the Chitabumen, Wei Rao the Shengchan, Xing Cheng Le Yiga Hu Xiang Lian Xi the Yu Ji Zheng Ti. So what have we seen so far for the Mao era? I just want to pause here and sum up a bit. Um, first of all, although we certainly associate the rise of systems thinking with the reform era for good reason, nonetheless, systems thinking, I think we can you know, conclude was very important in the Mao era as well. And this was very consistent with basic principles of material, dialectical materialism in that Mao era political and intellectual actors were emphasizing holistic analysis, the connections, the relationships, the dynamic interaction and further integration of parts within a whole, i.e. systems. And I would go so far as to suggest that integration itself might be considered a core political scientific value alongside some of the other values that those of us who spend our time thinking about science in the Mao era, and I know I'm not the only one, um, uh, have, you know, have already identified. So localism, self-reliance, mass mobilization, et cetera. Um, I'd also like to flag, I'm gonna come back to this later in the talk when we've had a chance to look at the reform era, but I wanna flag it now while integrated use is still fresh in our heads. Uh, PRC-based scholar Shui Jie has argued that Mao era integrated use was environmentalist and laid groundwork for the sustainable development paradigm of recent years. So again, I'll get back to this, but just to note that this is, um, this is one thing uh, we, wanna, we wanna be thinking about as we look at the reform era. But before we look at the reform era, I wanna zoom in for just a few minutes on the last couple Mao years 
uh, because in these years, 1975, 1976, we start to see the dots connecting more uh, meaningfully in agriculture, certainly, I think in other fields likely as well. Um, and in these years, we specifically see this term agroecological system emerging um, more prominently. And I want to look at two articles where we see that. Um, and spoiler alert, what we're going to see in these articles is that there is pretty vivid evidence, I would say, for um, the role of Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought in the way that people are conceiving of agroecological systems. So the first article, uh, 1975, by agronomist Shen Hung Li. I want to look specifically at the diagrams first, um, and you know I think we can see that there's a very clear resemblance, especially with the, the right-hand diagram, to the diagrams that we've already um, seen uh, in the earlier Mao era. Um, but note that in this case, they're not being called production links charts. These are not economic geographers writing um, anymore. Uh, I mean, economic geographers still are writing, but the, this one that we're looking at um, is not an economic geographer and uh, they're looking at it as an ecological system and they you know, label it as you know, depicting the structure of an ecological system. Also just interesting to note that um, unlike with the production links charts where human activities were implicit but not explicit in the, in the diagrams, here we see humans as actual components alongside other kinds of components, um, albeit fairly privileged components as in the right-hand diagram where the human is in that double ring right at the top, uh, indicating that they are the kind of central most important um, most important component of the system. Digging into the text, we see the author quoting Mao's oft-repeated assertion of the need to integrate agriculture, forestry, and animal husbandry. Here, Mao is actually himself quoting a Soviet agronomist, but it tends the concept tends to just be attributed to Mao in the literature. Um, the author also uses dialectics to interpret the significance of a traditional agricultural saying, the more pigs, the more fertilizer, the more grain. Um, and I would say the third quotation is also a very good example of dialectical thinking in that it's a critique of reductionist and linear perspectives about land and production relationships that allegedly arise from capitalist ideology and then encouraging us instead to embrace dialectics so that we can achieve a more holistic ecosystem based perspective. The second article that I want to look at from this, these last couple years of the Mao era is by a very influential scientist, Ma Shijun. Uh, Ma Shijun during the Mao era was recognized as a leading proponent of integrated control of insect pests. Uh, so integrated control um, in this, in this case, it, mean, uh, it means taking the um, chemical methods, biological methods, and agricultural methods of controlling insect pests and integrating them to create the most uh, economical and effective uh, and uh, environmentally sensible means of, uh, of controlling pests. Um, in the reform era, he becomes uh, the leading proponent and really widely recognized as the father of the field of eco ecological engineering in the PRC. And we'll see that this 1976 article bridges Mao era systems thinking and agriculture with this intensified focus on ecology that was to become a hallmark of the reform era. Now, Ma uses a number of different systems diagrams in his article, but I just want to share this one um, because I think it's just fascinating and really shows the degree to which systems thinking is, you know, structures all of his thinking. Um, because this is his depiction of the eight character charter um, in agriculture, which Mao proposed in the 1950s, and which is usually just given as a kind of list or a set of eight images. Um, but he uh, takes the trouble to figure out how to link them all up in this elaborate you know, systems, you're trying to show the relationships among all of them and how they all form this integrated whole. Um, it's a, you know, I think just a really clear indication of, of the significance of systems thinking for him. In the text, 
we see more evidence of the resonance with the systems thinking present in the earlier Mao era materials that we looked at. Uh, he quotes Mao and Lenin on the holistic study of a subject's many parts and the connections among them. And then he defines ecosystems in terms of those quotations. And so he says, fundamentally an ecosystem perspective is simply a perspective of the whole and the embrace and study of all connections and mediations of organisms and the environment. Now moving at last to the reform era, systems thinking and engineering are key pillars of the technocratic shift in the reform era. This is a process that scholars are increasingly becoming very familiar with through such works as the ones I'm listing here and others. Uh, systems thinking in agriculture maps, I think, pretty predictably onto the development of technocracy in the reform era. So I'm just looking briefly then at the emergence of three different academic movements that have built one on the other, and which in each case draws from and contributes to the political ideology and rhetoric of the time. Again, the by far the most influential scientist within agroecological engineering itself was the scientist, um, insect scientist Ma Shi Jun, and he's credited with establishing the four principles of agroecological engineering, which are typically translated as integrity, harmony, circulation, and regeneration. His 1987 book on agroecological engineering remains the touchstone for really all future work uh, in this field. And here I just offer a couple passages uh, in which he attempts to define agroecological engineering. And I'd particularly highlight this um, emphasis on harmonizing the ratios of agriculture, forestry, and livestock. Uh, so you can see a kind of calling back to that Mao um, uh, emphasis on integrating these three spheres, um, but the harmonizing the ratios, that uh, emphasis on harmony becomes politically more significant a bit later in the history, but we see it already is very important in the scientific literature, and actually it was already there uh, pretty prominently in economic literature in the Mao era as well. This rather blurry chart I show just to confirm the continued use of such diagrammatic representations of agricultural systems into the reform era. This is one of several in Ma Shi Jun's 1987 book. I chose this one just because it has, um, it focuses on that system that should be very familiar to us by now um, that integrates fish and mulberries and silk. Notice all the, also the methane ponds, which beginning in the 70s and then increasingly in the 80s and beyond uh, became a real focus for agroecological engineering because these ponds can, um, you know, convert, uh, you know, process waste products on the, uh, on the farm and also uh, produce not only fertilizer, but uh, energy as well for the village. This is another clear uh, diagram representing something similar uh, with more components. This article, uh, which was published in Eco Agricultural Research, um, includes more. It includes more components, but again, it, I, I picked this one of the many diagrams in that article just because it has that very familiar mulberry silkworm fish relationship, um, and also it has the we see the methane, which are is pretty ubiquitous at this point. Now, in the first decade of the 21st century, systems thinking in agriculture was further transformed by the emergence of the agricultural heritage movement. And I've discussed this at length in a recent article in Agricultural Terracing. But here the emphasis is not on recent or current forms of agroecological engineering, but rather on systems that were created a century or more ago and that can therefore be considered traditional. Uh, and this area of research has benefited quite a bit from a large project in the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, in which China has been a major player. And actually, the scholar and scientist I'm uh, quoting here uh, himself has been a major player. He's served on that committee in the Food and Agriculture Organization and really helped to shape the agricultural heritage movement and ensured that China has been playing a really big role there. Um, as uh, we see this, you know, uh, continued emphasis on systems thinking, especially integration, including the kind of integration that goes beyond material exchange to include more abstract 
and um, even epistemological forms of bridging. And as with the earlier decades of the reform era, we see this emphasis on harmony. And now that larger political context becomes increasingly important because it's in these years that Hu Jintao was using this concept of harmonious society to squash political activism. And so again, this theme of the co-production of scientific and political knowledge is, is pretty important. Still more uh, recently, we see efforts on the part of scientists to weave Xi Jinping's priority of ecological civilization into their work. And I wanna note here that ecological civilization is itself part of a kind of system at the policy level. Uh, and you know, it's called the, the five sphere general plan, which in Chinese, wei ti, it's like five pieces in one body. And we even see the use of these kind of diagrams that imply you know, a, system, a systems type relationship among these components. This one actually looks a lot to me like a um, five phases diagram from traditional Chinese um, natural philosophy and medicine. Um, so it's a kind of, kind of fascinating there. Um, and again, noticing the emphasis on harmony uh, and in the second quotation, you see the authors making this real effort to equate the goals of their field, which has been now established for several decades, with the more recent uh, political discourse on ecological civilization. So having looked at a bunch of different historical eras, I want to step back and um, ask about continuity. I think there are some pretty clear continuities that emerge from these materials. We certainly see a very consistent emphasis on the integration of mutually supportive components. Um, and I'm not going to read all of these, but just to show you some of the things that we've encountered and uh, see how they, you know, they connect. Um, and the second big continuity I would highlight is the centrality of economic logic. And again, we saw that very centrally in the mid Ming Dynasty text that we looked at, and we see it all through, certainly, the unsurprisingly, through the Mao and reform eras as well. But I think, you know, continuities can sometimes be overblown, and I want to think very carefully about how they're constructed and to what ends. So first of all, question, to what extent should we identify imperial era texts with systems thinking and or ecological agriculture? And I haven't come to a firm conclusion on this myself. Uh, it remains an open question for me. To the extent that I'm skeptical, I have to say it arises in part from the awareness of how claims of continuity bolster a kind of cultural nationalism. They're part of a larger claim about um, Chinese culture being uh, more environmentally uh, thoughtful than other cultures, more environmentalist, if you will. Um, now, clearly, there are differences from recent systems thinking, and I do think that those differences deserve more attention. And then on the flip side, um, I don't want to reject the possibility that some commonalities underlie the thinking in these different um, eras. And I also want to note that, of course, you know, in addition to, you know, worries about cultural nationalism, I mean, there's a really obvious positive side to trying to convince anybody that it's part of their cultural heritage to um, be more uh, conscious, uh, ecologically conscious. That's, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Um, getting back to Shuijia's argument uh, that Mao era integrated use created an important legacy um, for uh, more, you know, um, recent reform era environmental policy. Um, I agree with that, and I think it's an important argument. I've learned from it. I want to build on it. But I am more concerned with the specific kind of legacy. And to my eye, the continuity here lies less in an environmental ethic and more in a commitment to systems thinking. So the strong focus on systems, uh, you know, there's again, there's a benefit here, and it, if it aids in, um, in an ecological approach, that can be a good thing, um, but it's a specifically a technocratic approach, and that technocratic approach privileges stability, um, not only ecologically, but also politically, and that does intensify state power, so there's a, um, you know, there's something we need to be very conscious of. Now, even 
if we accept the existence of continuities, which again, I think there's good evidence for it in um, at least a few areas, the way that they're constructed appears to me to be at least as significant. So both traditional Chinese culture and Maoism are being constructed here as reservoirs of alternatives to dominant ideologies from the West that have proven unsatisfactory. And specifically here, the ideologies of reductionism and capitalist exploitation. And again, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think when we seek to question ideas that are dominant in Western society, which I think we should definitely do as a regular habit, whether we're in the West or China or elsewhere, it is very helpful to look to other times and places to see how things have been done differently, because this helps to sharpen our sense of the contingency of the world that we inhabit and our sense that the future could be different. Uh, but constructing these alternatives can also serve to obscure the complexities in those histories and reduce them to caricatures, such that we might fail to see, for example, tendencies toward reductionism and capitalism, or at least developmentalism in, you know, that these, these are present alongside holistic and sustainable strands um, uh, within Chinese agricultural philosophy. And this also raises the problem of the relationship of contemporary China to the Chinese past and to the global past and present. The Maoist and imperial era pasts could also serve as a kind of reservoir or kind of you know, foreign country where they do things differently, right? Our, our past is supposed to be. Um, and it could serve as that to help people critique uh, the present in China and their own current dominant ideologies. Um, in a sense, that might be what proponents of agroecology in China are doing, but with a kind of sleight of hand that can avoid some political trouble. So rather than highlight the ways in which contemporary China falls short of certain ideals that they would represent with, through constructed pasts, um, they, you know, instead, I would say, highlight the ways that environmental policies in the present that they like and that they want to reinforce uh, are really continuities with the Chinese heritage, um, whether that's a traditional heritage or what they call red heritage, right? So my own goal in this project is to push myself to think critically and expansively about the history of agricultural systems thinking in the PRC, recognizing ways it has been informed and enriched by both traditional Chinese approaches to agriculture and by Marxist dialectics, and also the ways in which it's enabled a less critical and more technocratic approach. Now this technocratic approach privileges stability and harmony, and so it's understandably attractive to the many people very rightly terrified by the climate catastrophe, but for that same reason, it's also worrisome to many of these same people myself included, who are at the same time concerned about the future of dissent and democracy. So on both sides of the dilemma, both within China and from afar, the meaning of Chinese agricultural knowledge is of the utmost importance. And I'll stop there and really look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you, Sigrid. That, that gave um, us all a lot to think about. Yeah, virtual applause from everybody. Um, and I already see some hands or some, some thumbs up and some applause and some hands. Um, uh, definitely a few things I'd like to, I'd like to uh, hear more about, but I'll start uh, with Emily. Please lead us off. I think good. Thank you. That was super interesting. And um, I apologize. I'm going to have to run after I ask this question because I have another meeting. Um, but I just was curious if you've thought outside of environmentalism, um, uh, because you know, as I was listening to you talk, I couldn't help but think that there's a lot of similarity between systems thinking in, um, you know, what you were discussing and the type of correlative cosmology of traditional Chinese medicine. And you had mentioned Wuxing, um, but I was also thinking like in some of the uh, diagrams that you showed, um, it reminded me a lot of the um, Neijing Tu. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but, um, where all the different parts of the body are represented by people performing a different kind of environmental function and it's all working in this very holistic manner. So I wonder if there's some kind of correspondence you can draw uh, beyond just in, in the environmental studies. 
That is great. I am definitely taking a note of that and will remember to um, think integrate it in, if you will. Um, I mean, my own focus is really going to be on the agriculture, but I do think that for this part, you know, I'm imagining this as a chapter in a book, um, who knows how long it'll take to get there given everything, but, um, but I do think I want to provide some sense of how this is not limited to agriculture or even to you know, environmental thinking. Um, and there are other people who are also looking at systems thinking from other perspectives. I mean, usually when people look at um, the history of systems theory, whether in China or elsewhere, um, the, the main focus is in cybernetics with ecology, I think being a secondary um, interest, uh, you know, area where, where people see a lot. But I guess what I want to suggest is that um, it's pervading everything. So certainly, you know, the, um, and I'm sure Josh is finding a lot of um, this stuff familiar with because I know he has a lot um, in the book that draws on um, Zong He Leong uh, integrated use uh, uh, materials you know, that were that were focusing on that. So you know, and again, Jen Altahanger looking at the industry, the timber and uh, um, and uh, fiberboard industry. So it's it's not necessarily being viewed as specific environmental unless we take the kind of very broad perspective on environmental and my sense is that it's um you know that it's everywhere so that's a really that the looking at the Meijing two is a great um is a great idea um and I'll definitely look at that and how it was you know how it was described and presented and circulated and that kind of thing so great uh, great idea. Thank you. I, I, I got you go to it wonderful okay. seeing everyone. <laughs> I miss you all. Good to see you. Uh, Mir had a question and then Jenny. Hi, it's wonderful seeing all of you. Sigrid, I absolutely enjoyed that so much. Um, I had um, one perhaps directly on point question and then one question that sort of meanders off. Um, so the, the on point question was, um, I'm just wondering in addition to the bases and dialectical materialism that you see, which I, I certainly see as well, how much do you think is, this is connected um, to scientific planning? Taylorism, basically, because it's all about breaking up um, work into um, systems um, and linkages. It's about efficiency leading to economic productivity. And that's a theme that I'm th seeing through many of these. And it often uses diagrams like this. And uh, you got a double dose of it in China coming in through scientific management books in the 20s and 30s, and then again from the Soviet Union as part of a sort of planned economy thinking. So I'm wondering how much that is also, um, you know, impacting on the generation of this thinking. So that's the more to the point question. The less to the point question is, um, I too, of course, have seen um, lots and lots of systemic diagrams. Uh, every single parasitic disease propaganda poster shows it as a circle uh, and includes people going to the bathroom and the generation of all of the sort of parasitic disease sequences. Um, and what I have discovered is these kinds of posters, at least from both the archives and the interviews I've done, were completely incomprehensible to common people. I mean, most of them didn't get these types of systemic thinking, at least in that specific instance. So the sort of off target question is, do you have any sense how the, these portrayals and the, the pushing of systemic thinking is actually being uptook, understood or processed by common folks? Okay, I love both of these questions. Actually, I think I love the uh, off the point question even more than the on point question. Um, and I'll try not to talk on and on and on here about these, although I feel like I could go on forever. So yes, um, I, you know, I think this is a 
this is a global history of systems thinking um, and the Taylorism is definitely a part of it. You know, so in addition to cybernetics and ecology, another major area um, that kind of forms this very, it's not just transnational, but it's trans field, trans interdisciplinary, if you will, right? Um, is uh, operations research, you know, and, and operations management, you know, within the kind of sphere of management, right? And so the, that world is um, is very present as well. And in a different version of this talk, I go off on this long thing about, um, you know, to what extent is systems thinking in China dialectical and more dialectical than systems thinking um, elsewhere. And I don't have any real conclusions about that, but I'm especially inspired by um, one of the leading lights of the science for the people movement, uh, Richard Levins, um, really brilliant Marxist biologist, um, has this old essay on systems thinking and dialectics in which he's basically saying, you know, basically systems thinking is like, you know, all these people wanting something out of Marxism, but not really getting it, you know, trying to get, get Marxism without the Marxism, um, and that it in fact loses a lot in the process and it's insufficiently um, critical and insufficiently reflexive and insufficiently um, tied to real life struggles, um, you know. And so it's, it's interesting to me, but I think, honestly, I think that the stuff that I'm seeing, there may be some hints here and there that it's benefiting from a stronger dialectical critical kind of perspective, you know, for example, in the critique of, you know, reductionist linear um, analyses of, uh, of um, land use and production, um, but there tends to be a similar um, a similar way in which it actually gets pretty reductive and lacks the critical edge that we might expect um, out of dialectics, that systems thinking it, it's a dilution. So that, that's what I'm playing with now. And I, I think you're, you're exactly right to highlight those. Um, and then on the, um, you know, the question of the uh, diagrams and what, you know, how these were up took, um, up taken. Um, I think, you know, my, what I'm looking at now, although I'd like to get there, but um, my interest at this point in looking at them is really in how they are um, not being disseminated to uh, the masses, but rather influencing others in um, the scientific fields, right? How they are contributing to the development of knowledge among professionals in, in different fields. Um, but it's interesting to me because I think this your question also really gets at the question of, um, embodied knowledge and, you know, lived practice, right? And so, you know, when um, a modern scholar looks at a mid-Ming dynasty text and sees in it a kind of consciousness of ecological principles and a, like an ecological practices of agriculture that demonstrate an awareness of how, you um, agriculture is in fact ecologically based, you know, what they're doing is trying to make a leap past what comes through in an elite text to the consciousness of farmers, right? Um, or at least if not their consciousness, their practice, right? But that question of the relationship between the practice and the consciousness is hard to get at. And I would say that that's also true for getting at farmers today, right? And so to what extent they're gonna look at a diagram and understand that as a system is one question. And to what extent they have their own systems thinking that might not be expressed in diagrams, but nonetheless, you know, just by their very agricultural practices, it's clear that they have that kind of um, understanding or awareness. I mean, that's hard to get at, but I think a really important and good question. So I really, I really like those questions and appreciate them. Just uh, one, one follow-up comment to it. I mean, one of the things that I saw was very sophisticated sets of connections, but also often not uh, cutting up the world into the pieces in such a way that you would think of them as a sequence of interaction because the world was viewed so, was actually viewed very holistically. And so you didn't think to uh, make one-on-one -on -one linkages in a circle. 
And so by making that diagram, you are cutting up the world in such a way that you're actually denying a true holistic perception of the connectivity of everything. So definitely, but I, I guess what I would say to that is that science is in some ways by nature reductive, right? It's like you have to simplify in order to understand. And so the effort, I think here, I completely agree with you. I mean, anytime you create a diagram and it, you can get very Taoist with it, right? Anytime you express anything in words, you're, you know, cutting things up and whatever. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think that's, a, that's exactly where it's at. Right. But I mean, what, what I'm trying to say is absolutely scientists have to do that. But in terms of connecting with common people, the minute you've done that, you're moving away from the way they experience the world. Or I not agree. everybody, but at least some. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Thank you. Thanks, Mir. And Jenny sent a note that she's got to hit the road, um, but she will follow up by email, Sigrid. Uh, Jeremy, uh, uh, please jump in. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm really interested in the diagrams as well, and I wanted to hear your thoughts a bit more on the people who created the diagrams and the venues in which they appeared, because I'm curious about uh, what was the point of the diagrams? Like, is the, is the point to educate people and describe this is the way the world works, everything is connected, here's the connections that you need to know about Gaokao students uh, or farmers or agricultural scientists. So is it is the point educational or is the point to describe or, or actually prescribe like we need to do it this way, right? Let's make sure that we that all these things are connected and that and our agriculture will be better, it will be more harmonious. So do you see it as more educational, as more prescriptive? Or the third possibility that I see is it's actually meant to befuddle and bamboozle and confuse. Um, because what I'm seeing in these diagrams is a ton of confusion, like there's all kinds of random lines and sometimes there's circles and there's all these weird shapes. And the one with Masha Jun was totally bizarre to me. Like what is going on with the there's verb? Like what is Bao and Guan and me? Like is the point is to show that he's smart. Like it, like it, maybe the point is to show the scientist has a really interesting, brilliant brain and needs to prove it to the world by coming up with a diagram that nobody's ever thought of before. At least that was my reaction to the to the Masha June one, which maybe you could walk us through a bit. So just interested in, in, in like kind of the basic question is what is the point of creating these diagrams? Wow, okay, nice provocative question. I love it. Um, so I would say the, so the diagrams that I'm looking at with the exception of the one that comes out of the Gaokao prep materials, are all appearing in academic articles and um, one of them was a book, right? So these are, um, the audience for this is other scientists um, in a variety of fields uh, and not necessarily, certainly not farmers, right? Um, and, you know, students, again, not, I don't think reading that, but then what you see is the evidence that, oh, yay, yay. Oh, sorry. Oh, my God. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm not seeing evidence that that is um, getting into, you know, that it's used. Oh, well, no, actually, I see mention, although I haven't tracked down the actual things, um, that there are posters related to these uh, production links charts um, that are used for educational purposes in schools. So yes, I would say educational as well, but the things, the ones that I showed were examples from professional journals and, and one book. Um, so I, you know, I definitely don't think the point is to befuddle. Um, in the case of that one example with Masha Zuin, I mean, I included that one just because I think it's, it's because it's so oddball, it I think helps prove the point of how, um, how systems thinking and systems analysis had become so convincing to people and so you know much a mark that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing you're, you're make you're doing the right kind of analysis if you show something has all of these you know relationships and and can be thought of in terms of a system uh, that it's it's only in such a context that anyone would even dream of connecting all of those I'm not sure it's really worth my going through and seeing I mean I've looked at it and I'm like oh well they're all 
connected to four or five of the other eight or something. And you have Guan in the middle, which um, he goes on in the text to explain that he thinks, you know, management is really the central one of the all of these eight different areas where you're supposed to be modernizing Chinese agriculture, that it comes down to management. And again, that highlights, um, and he specifically says that that's because that's the most human of it. It's the, it involves, you know, the kind of conscious human activity. So he's putting that at the center. You know, so there's there's some rhyme or reason into, into how he did it. But I would say that's an example where, you know, you really didn't need to create a systems diagram there, right? And it clearly shows that I, I don't think that, I mean, who knows, maybe he's, he was that kind of an arrogant person, but I don't think he was trying to mess with us, you know, or just flaunt his, uh, you know, his knowledge. But I do think it shows that he valued systems thinking in a way that's, you know, becomes like blatant, right? Um, the describing and prescribing, I think, are the key things. I mean, I think this is really an effort to try to understand the world in a way that is simultaneously complex and also manageable, right? It's taking the world as it, unlike in the, you know, allegedly reductionist and linear capitalist world, it's going to understand all of the different components and, you know, do it in the proper Leninist way. But um, it's doing that for the purpose of gaining control over the uh, natural and human worlds. Um, so it is both description and also prescription in that sense. Um, but yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Thanks so much. Have, thanks, Jeremy. I, I have a question from Jaime, uh, if that's all right. And, and I'll, I, I actually wanna combine it with a question really quick. And that, that is just a basic comparative question. Uh, Jaime asked about this applying to different climates and different contexts within Within China, so different different ecosystems within China, um, is it, are, are there similar sort of mo uh, models developed when when this particular you know crop and cycle is not is not available, or is this particular to this one because of maybe the implications of the cultural nationalism of silk, or or you know is, is that a factor? Um, and think I, I think I remember an old uh, film uh, documentary film by Stephen Lansing called The Three Worlds of Bali, in which he notes how the the modern science comes in and and sort of distorts the what they call the the, the temple rhythms, the, the the sort of holiday rhythms of uh, of the, the the Buddhist Hindu celebrations that were going on there, and how that kept agriculture going. And that also just to sort of expand a little bit on what Jaime was asking as well is, I think you answered it to some extent when you use this phrase "sleight of hand," and that is that the the, the Xi Jinping, like Mao, wants to see the Communist Party as rescuing the benighted peasants to some extent from this dark feudal past, but they also want to harness the idea of cultural nationalism and that, that sort of, uh, you know, in, in, in America would be that sort of all shucks farmer kind of who, who, who says, well, I, I already got it figured out. I don't need you, you know, coming in and telling me how to do this. So to what extent are they har harnessing what they see as a kind of, um, a, a, a kind of cultural uh, of itself fully formed idea, idea and way of doing things and to what extent are they coming in? This also connects a little bit to Mir and, uh, and, and Jeremy's question, but um, there's a, a lot, a lot of, of sort of scattered uh, ideas in there, but I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that and maybe in different contexts as well. Great. Um, yeah, great questions. So I really did just pick um, the Dyke Pond um, example because I think it's kind of the most iconic and has been the most influential globally. Um, you know, it's the one that people tend to um, tend to point to when they talk about um, uh, you know ecological agriculture in traditional China. Um, there are others. Um, so another one, although it also it tends to be in the same general areas, um, is uh, Dao Tian Yang Yi, which is raising rice, uh, sorry, raising fish in rice paddies. Um, and that is another like beautiful one too. You can take these really pretty pictures of rice plants and the, you know, orange fish um, swimming through them. Um, and it has been uh, 
promoted, uh, was promoted in the 60s and is um, promoted a lot now as well. And then there are all kinds of other um, agroecological systems, including ones that are highlighted specifically as agricultural heritage systems. So within this you know, movement today um, at really emphasizing that past um, and the idea that is, this is um, you know, something beautiful from Chinese tradition that can help save the world. Um, and those include uh, the one that I talk about in the, in the article I, I published recently is the agricultural terracing um, as a system. And that's also described as a system. It's, it doesn't tend to be depicted in quite the same way with the, um, uh, with the ecological, I mean, it is sometimes, but it doesn't have, it doesn't have that same um, kind of exemplar uh, status, but there are these other, um, they, you know, the each of the articles that I cited, you know, would have one picture that, uh, one diagram that uh, describes the um, fish pond silk system and um, others that will describe other systems. So I just picked this one because it's um, of its, uh, how, how iconic it is. Um, and then, yeah, you know, that sleight of hand thing, I, I was thinking more of the sleight of hand of, um, people, you know, environmentalist scientists today who need to, you know, they want to advocate for certain stronger environmentalist uh, policies, but they need to do it in a way that is going to be politically um, sensible, right? And they have the benefit, I mean, the, it's, it's a benefit that the state is talking about ecological civilization because it means that you can tie all kinds of things to what the state is saying you should do and say that you're consistent with the state. So that's great. And that's really the sleight of hand I was talking about, but you're right, there is this other sleight of hand and we saw this, you know, maybe even more so with Mao, right? Um, and certainly, in, you know, medicine, you know, it's like you, you're going to trash tradition in all of these different ways, but um, then if you can uh, portray it as the, um, you know, the masses knowledge, um, you know, accumulated over the centuries of, um, of labor, um, then you can, uh, you know, you can valorize it instead of trash it. So that's certainly going on. And it, that goes on now too, with I think a double layer, right? It's both the past of the, of, you know, imperial era China, and then also the socialist past, which is they, you know, they've got conflicted relationship with both of those pasts now. Um, so there's multiple slides of hand going on there, I think. Thanks, you made, you made sense of my jumbled question. Uh, no, thank your you, question's Sigrid. great. Um, the, uh, Josh has his hand up. Sorry, Josh, jump in, please. Thanks for the, the talk was great and I'm really enjoying the questions and, and discussion. It's really great. Um, uh, the first is just a comment that, that, that because I think that you, there's so many layers of, of the readings of these diagrams and, and understandings that I, I just want to throw one that comes to mind after everyone's been saying what they, you know, these, all those really interesting observations. It's just, um, there's also kind of the question of the target actor, not just the audience of the reader, but kind of what, you know, that, that start that had the Ren in it is like, well, who does that mean, right? Like, so for the, the first doc, the first kind of document that you talked about from the Ming, which didn't have a diagram, but it was very clear, like, this is for the entrepreneurial farmer. Right, and it's all about their interests, and of course, that interest is cash. Um, and and then when you get to the, you know, who is the actor? I mean, it's interesting. It's like, well, management is the key term here because it's the human term. But it's like that's not a person. That's the managerial class or whoever, whatever unit or whatever body it is that will manage this sector. Um, and then you know, so it's interesting to this like ecology that's being produced today in these diagrams and these pictures of like, who's doing that? And who for whose interest? And what is the acting laboring place, um, you know? And where is it located in the, in the movement of goods and people that we've got going on? So that's just a comment. Um, my question is, you just mentioned this kind of, it's a chapter in a book possibly. And I wanna know like, because this and it's there's so much going on in just what you talked about it's like what is the book like what is the big picture that you're putting this ama amazing piece into
Okay, so thank you for the comment. And I think that's really um, apt. And I need to think about that. A, a couple other people when I've given different versions of this talk have uh, highlighted the point that labor seems bizarrely not present, you know, and we're looking at, um, you know, as people who are economic geographers, but like it's all material resources that are connecting and where the where's the labor here. Um, so I think, you know, your your question relates to that as well. It's like there are different kinds of people you would think that class and labor and um, the the who managers and that kind of thing that that, that would be part of this. Um, so yeah, I need I need to think about that more. And I really appreciate that comment. Um, so the book, you know, sometimes I think this book is really clear in my head, and, so, and even though most of the research I haven't done yet, um, and sometimes I have to go back and like read the thing I, you know, has sketched out for myself uh, again to remind myself that it, there's a real thing here. Um, I'm calling it tentatively heritage and survival, the power of agricultural knowledge in the People's Republic of China. And I'm thinking about a, um, I'm thinking about looking at systems, systems thinking, agricultural systems thinking, um, among other kinds of almost like little case studies or um, little examples that are going to connect together. Um, I have another thing that I'm thinking of um, working on that will probably be the next one that I start sketching out, although time is really different right now. And so I don't know when any of this is happening. But um, uh, I have another chapter where I'm really interested in, um, and again, there's a there's a current thing that's happening that um, I want to connect it to. So the current thing that I encountered just by chance in China um, is this thing called um, uh, uh, Chinese medicine agriculture. So with the idea that um, you use basically stuff from the Materia Medica and apply it to agriculture in order to protect plants against disease and, um, and insect pests. Uh, and to some extent, there's also like applying the principles, but for the most part, it's really applying the actual Materia Medica. Um, and it's, I want to connect this with uh, this thing that happened, especially around the Great Leap Forward um, of uh, Tu Nong Yao, which is the use of, you know, it's the development of native insecticides, but also very much like the Materia Medica and the, the materials that were produced to describe these plants and, and what you would, you know, how you use them. It looks like the Materia Medica to me, you know, the way it goes through each plant and describes it and its, um, its uses. Um, it, uh, so I, I'm interested in that and I'm kind of pursuing that as um, a piece as well. And then I want to include the stuff I've been looking at um, in terms of terracing um, in uh, both the uh, kind of destructive and also the uh, preservationist uh, aspects of that and the way in which um, agricultural heritage is coming, you know, so agri agricultural heritage, again, being a concept that's used now, um, but that has um, had a, you know, uh, a precursor um, in the Mao era that couldn't be, wasn't called heritage, but it was um, also the same, you know, what Jeremy Murray was pointing out with the um, you know, the sleight of hand there, you know, in terms of how you deal with the past. So all that stuff together, I think makes a book. Um, and I am really, um, I am really wanting to foreground questions of, um, you know, heritage and then survival, the, the forward looking thing, because, um, boy, I want to be relevant to the um, disasters that we're facing. Um, and uh, I want I want, to, I want to believe that the stuff I'm thinking about has relevance to um, the big questions we're facing, as I know you do, Josh, um, and I have taken some inspiration from you there. It sounds like a great book. I think that's, that's really, really great. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. And I think, uh, Amir, I, I saw your hand. I, I, we are a little over time. I want to wrap up shortly. Um, 
Uh, so Sigurd, if you had any closing thoughts, but Amir, if you want to jump in uh, first with a with a question or comment, and then we'll we'll start wrapping up. Let me just make a couple comments, mainly inspired by all the wonderful things uh, everyone has been saying, but Sigrid has been responding. So Sigrid, one thing I wonder in terms of where is labor? A another way of thinking about this is where is the motive energy that connects or flows through this system to systems to move it along? Is it labor power? Is it the sun? Where are the energy systems? Um, uh, and so, because that's the flow factor, actually. Um, so that's one thing to think about if you could somehow think through how, how they're thinking through energy flow factors. Um, and then the, the other comment was, as, as you were talking about the broader book, it, it was, I was just thinking back to Mao's attack on theory um, and on sort of theoretical and frankly, um, within the medical profession on systemic thinking. Um, that basically, if you look at the Barefoot Doctor's Handbook, instead of taking a, a syndrome, I mean, a systemic approach, it isolates everything down to this system, this disease, this herb, this whatever. Um, it's, it's supposed to be very practical, but it ends up being incredibly difficult to apply because instead of having a system of knowledge, what you have is thousands of factoids that you're supposed to apply to the complexity of the human being. And so that push against systemic thinking or against theoretical constructs, how is that working as a countervailing tendency or is it interacting in any way with the systemic thinking that you're seeing within these communities of thought? Ooh, big ones. And I know we're out of time. So um, yes, I mean, so interesting, like the with ecological diagrams, the sun is often the thing that it's like starting the whole thing. So those actually, I think one of the diagrams I had actually had the sun, solar energy um, in there. So that's typical of, a, um, you know, ecology, they look at the flow of energy, and it all comes back to the sun eventually. Um, with the other ones, that's an interesting question with the production links diagrams. I'm not sure that energy is the way they're thinking about it, but I'll have to go back and look at it and maybe also um, pick Josh's brain because I know he's looked at this stuff for waste um, waste cycling. Um, I, the, your second comment slash question I think is a bigger one and maybe we need to hash it out at some point. I mean, Yes, there there is an attack on theory in the sense that you know um, valuing practice over theory. But I'm not sure that I would. I'll have to think more about whether I also see an attack on systems thinking because I think so much of the, um, so much of these Maoist um, slogans and policies and that kind of thing are. Um, are really about integration, you know. So um, the idea of the three and one, and the you know five parts, you know, in a whole, and all of these things are um, uh, are very much. I mean, they didn't necessarily come out of Mao's mouth, but they were um, they were pursued as consistent with a radical approach to science and technology. So I'll have to, I'll have to think about that for sure. I think it's a really good question. Um, uh, but I guess, you know, the only, Jeremy asked me for um, summarizing comments. Um, and I think my main summarizing comment is just thank you. For one thing, it's really great to see you all, many old friends um, and, uh, some new faces and um, I um, just really am very honored that you guys took the time at this extremely busy time of the year to uh, listen to me talk about my project and offer such helpful comments and questions. So thank you is my summary comment. Thank you, Sigrid. Um, and yeah, indeed, thanks, thanks Jim and, and Jaime and Brittany and Jeremy and Mir. Um, and Josh, it's really cool to see you guys. Really wonderful to see everybody. 
Um, I do wish we had another hour and a half to talk about the Critical China Scholars group. Um, so if you don't know about that, uh, please do check it out. It's, they're, they're, they're really, a, a, a reading some of their materials is definitely a tonic uh, for our time in, the, in the, 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 the sort of binary of Beijing, Washington, when everybody's expect to, expected to, to, to jump on one of those horses. Uh, so I, I, I really like reading that. I encourage everybody to check out their, their website. I'll put it, um, I'll, I'll share it with a group. It's already in the chat. Um, Thanks so, thank so much you, for that. Everybody. And also on that website, you can find the information on how to join the listserv where some good stuff gets posted. So FYI. I will actually just so everybody can, if they want to, can take just a second and I'll go ahead and post it one more time. Uh, that's the statement of principles page. But of course, you'll find if you click through there, you'll find very quickly um, uh, how to learn uh, how to learn more. Thanks, Jaime, for joining us. Um, and uh, yeah, definitely, definitely click through. I think it's a really refreshing group of, and, and the, the, the kind of language that's used there, unfortunately enough. Um, so it's, it's energizing and exciting. Thank you so, so much, David, it's been delightful. And thanks for the, for the, to the crew. I got a couple of flashbacks there with the critical China scholars to, to Eshrick and the Concerned and, and also Pickowitz, but also to the, to the phone going off. Um, you would have you would have failed Professor Pickowitz's class there. I think that was the that it, or was it happened ha, had to happen twice and then you failed, right? I, I remember oh. Chris Hess was TA, and and uh, and he would he would come into the class and take the battery out of his phone. He wouldn't just turn it off. He would. This was when you could still get at that, that your phone in that way without some little screwdrivers or whatever. He would actually take the battery out of his phone because he was so worried that his phone would ring as, as TA in, in Professor Pickowitz's class. So I had a, well, that's I what still I have that. Done. I, I actually turned that. everything off. I was so, so careful, but that was my alarm. And the alarm it is- It was a great memory. By the, so how, you know, what? It was a great, yeah, it was a great flashback. Yeah, we'll do that next time. But I, it, it, it was a really fun flashback. And it, rem it reminded me of, of Chris Hess and, 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 uh, and TAing that class with him. And, and now still anytime, like if, if my phone goes off during any kind of session, I think that panic is from, you know, 2004, 2005, sitting in, in Professor Pickowitz's class, that, that is the same sort of, uh, uh, you know, generational, you know, anxiety that, that comes from, from the, the fear he instilled uh, from that class, but uh, in a good way, of course. Anyway, that was, an, that was a fun memory. And it's really cool to see everybody's faces. I, I, it's such a delight to see you guys. Oh, uh, last thing, Jenny uh, uh, is gonna be the same time next week. Um, and she'll be talking about her book, uh, I'm sure with some updates, uh, her, her book on Chinese diplomats uh, abroad. So that should be a really cool talk. And that's gonna be the last one uh, for this, this, um, this year, unfortunately, and, and hopefully we'll keep going. And, and I'll get all, all the rest of you guys in um, if I can renew funding. Uh, but thanks, thanks so much, everybody, for joining. And thank, thank you, you all. Thanks, thanks. Wonderful so seeing everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Okay, thanks so much one more time, Jeremy. Uh, absolutely. Oops.